This is a Galactic Network podcast. The Podcast of Terror is a great podcast. It's covering movies that are not for children, and thus this podcast is not for children. The hosts are two adults who will use bad words from time to time. They'll also spoil movies if that's not your thing. So if you don't like spoilers and you don't want to hear some dirty language or some dirty references to dirty parts of your body, then please, please, please wash your body parts better and do not listen to this show. If you can handle it, and I hope you can because there's a great podcast coming up, then please proceed with Podcast of Terror. Episode 141 of the Podcast Terror, production of the Galactic Network. I am your host, Matt Stein. There's a bunch of other stuff I forgot to say here. Don't have my sheet in front of me. Uh, for more on this podcast, including show notes, content information, subscription links, go to gncast.com slash pot. Uh, Corey will be here shortly. Also joining us this week is Kyle Skogquist. Uh, Kyle was on an episode a long time ago. I forgot to pull the number. Uh, I talked about Trick or Treat starring Gene Simmons. Uh, Kyle used to play guitar in a band called Impaler. Uh, so I met him through through band guys, but he'll be here shortly, and we will talk about The Shining and probably a bunch of other random stuff. Like I said, it's the first time that we've had a phone person, it's or not. You know. No, we, when Travis was on the first time. he was. I thought he was using Hangouts from his phone, though. That might have been it, yeah. Which is funny because and Kyle knows Travis. So it's a, it's a Who is that? Uh, Travis... Bartosik from Abiotic. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm pretty sure I met the two of you on the same tour, so. Yeah, probably. Small yeah, a few years person. ago. Actually, oddly enough, so things that have changed, uh, Corey now lives in Michigan again. He was in California oh, really? on the first episode. Yeah, Kyle's in Michigan now, and Travis is actually on tour in Michigan tonight. Oh, wow. Yeah, what are the odds? Huh. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're if you're if you're listening to this, that's the the soft, sultry, baritone voice of my friend Kyle Skogquist. Hello. <laughs> uh, and as I mentioned in the intro, Kyle was on. Oh, I finally found it. Episode fifteen, almost three full years ago. Wow, was it that long? Yeah, yeah, and. Um, I, some backstory. The whole reason that this thing came about is because I got really drunk in the Northwoods of Wisconsin. Shocker to anyone listening. I got drunk. Uh, and I saw someone with a giant impaler patch on their back. And I just texted you, and here we are. And here we are. Here we are. It's been quite a while, buddy. I miss you. It has. Time flies as we get older, huh? Holy shit. Yeah, it was uh, a year ago. That, well, you unfortunately weren't able to make it, but we were supposed to go on a trip to Ohio, which ended up being like the longest two days of my life because of nonstop snowstorms. But you win some, you lose some. Yeah, yeah. Go see Chimera. That would have been uh, that would have been sweet. Yeah. Well, now that they've played that one show, there's a very good chance that they're going to be back together sooner or later. Well, maybe, uh, maybe we'll try to make the next one. I, I fucking hope so. I just hope that they don't do it in December. Like I, I get well, don't they have that thing, the annual uh, New Year's show they did. in uh, Cleveland every year, like when they were together? Yeah, yeah, they did. Uh, that's what the last year was. It was that Chimera Christmas show. But maybe they'll tour. Yeah. I, don't know. I know that a couple of the guys did that other band, which wasn't very good in my opinion. I can't remember the name. Uh, never, never heard that one, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was good to hear that they got like the main lineup back because. Uh, uh, Played with them about four years ago, and uh, Mark was the only original member. And the guys he got were good, but uh, it uh, it just yeah. didn't have that same magic as uh, the, the Impossibility of Reason lineup. Right. It's not. Yeah. It's not quite the same. Um, Rob Arnold started a band called The Elite, and that oh okay back in September. I didn't care for the song. Um, it's more like hard rock than anything, but. <clears throat> I, I back sure. to what you were saying. I was like, I do agree. I mean, I saw him. Shit. Yeah, it was the impossibility of reason. Right when that album came out, we saw him. They they play like three shows every tour in Wisconsin. 
and they were all like oh, within really? an hour, hour and a half of where we, where I lived at the time. So we would just go to all three. That's cool. Yeah. Um. So it was kind of weird to see those guys all the time. And we, I remember one time we played a show in uh, Cleveland at Peabody's, I believe it was. That's gone now, but this was. Peabody's is gone. Yeah, Peabody's has been gone for a while. <laughs> I love that place too. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, so we played. It was like a local showcase, and um, Jason, he was the original guitar player. I can't think of his last name. Um, God, I bet the internet knows. Uh, but anyways, his his band was like headlining this showcase, and I just was outside outside on the phone calling my girlfriend, and all of Chimera walked in. And this oh, wow. Was, yeah, this cool. was in 2006, 2005. Yeah, Jason Hagar, that's who it was. Okay. Um, but, yeah, and so they all went there, and, I mean, it was it was kind of cool just to see. I mean, at the time that 2006 was looking for an album, an album release here, 2005. So, shit. In between was it, uh, Self-Titled and Resurrection. Self-Titled? Oh, Resurrection, that's right. In between the two. Um, so, yeah, that was... Man, that was a good time. Resurrection was a solid fucking album. Yeah, it really was. Hmm. It really wasn't... Uh, I don't know. I didn't really think there was any weak albums uh, from Chimera. Uh, even the earlier stuff was good, but it was a, just a slightly different uh, style. It was... Um... I I agree. I mean, uh, Possibility of Reason was more new metal. Yeah. Like I remember that one song, Dead Inside. I saw them play. Or they played it on. Fuck. What was that farm? Fat farm? Ant farm? That that it was like a TV show where they would have bands play. Back when. Oh right. Bands still played on TV. Um, mm mm-hmm. But yeah, it was just so fucking new metal, and then their self-titled came out, and it was. Oh no! I'm sorry. Pass out of existence is what I keep calling the impossibility of reason. Um, pass out of existence is when I first saw him. And then oh yeah, reason yeah, me out. too. And that was like super. That was uh, straight heavy. 2000, 2002, 2003. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I saw him there with uh, Danzig and Prong. Oh God, that was. They came a lot with. Um, I want to say I saw him with like Forty Below Summer a bunch. Fear Factory and okay. Nino, they played with those yeah. a lot. Uh, but yeah, Pass Out of Existence was was more new metal. Um, Possibility of Reason is when they went like just straight metal. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. So fucking good. Yeah, that one's definitely my favorite. I, I love all the drummers that they got, but Andals, I think, was definitely their, their best drummer. Agreed. They had the... Uh, what band did they pull a bunch of guys from? At one point, it was like... The Soil Work? Yes. It was Soil Work. Uh, Ricky? Yeah. Ricky from Soil Work? Yeah. They had... Uh, damn. I'm trying to think of what lineup it was. It was like a lot of... It was almost an entirely different band. And then just Mark Hunter. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, well, that's... Kind of with a lot of bands these days. Uh, hard to keep the, the starting lineup... Yeah, it's hard uh, to think consistent. about. Uh, I saw like Kiss is doing another farewell tour. Yeah, which uh, I'm actually pretty excited about because uh, I think there's pretty good chance that they're gonna involve all of the surviving members of of Kiss, like throughout the you know the different lineups, like Ace and uh, Bruce Kulick actually got up on stage and played some songs with them. Uh, uh, during the Kiss cruise recently, and uh, Vinny Vincent put on his makeup and played the pre-show. So uh, Paul Stanley said he's not ruling out involving uh, past members on this tour. But do you really think it's their last one? <clears throat> well, um, I don't think it is going to be like the end of Kiss, but I think it's pretty much going to be like... Uh, what Ozzy is doing, like they're, it's the last time they're going to go out doing a world tour. I think they're still going to probably play some one-off big shows or whatnot. I mean, I could see them milking whatever they need to to get to the 50-year mark, and then they had talked about possibly doing like an American Idol type setup to replace all the current members of Kiss and 
that way kiss can be continuing forever which is a neat idea but for any original kiss fan that's i don't think that's really cool to like i wouldn't go and see the the new lineup of kiss no uh, when when would they be 50 do you know offhand um well they've they've kind of gone back and forth like they've said 73 but i've also heard gene mention 72 um he might be referring to him and paul and wicked lester but uh I think the uh, the first like time that the four original members got together, I, I think was probably um, seventy three. So um, they they're, they're classifying. They've been together for forty five years right now. So and they're going to do a, a three year long farewell tour, which means they would have two more years left to you know try to stretch that fifty year mark. Which they could just not do anything for two years. I would like to hear him do one more album and involve all all past members and current members of of the band. I think that would I think that would actually be a great way to go out, and I think fans would appreciate it. Would that be like a live <laughs> four or something? Uh, well, they did a live four in uh, uh, with the uh, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Okay, um, but. Yeah, I mean, maybe they could do like a live five or something, which would make sense for their fiftieth. <laughs> What's that? If that would make sense for their fiftieth is in a live album every for every ten years. Oh right, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure they'll have something planned. I mean, they they always do a great job of hyping everything up. They've been on a lot of daytime and nighttime television shows, making appearances, doing performances, and. They know how to market and build the hype. Um, so I, even if you know they don't tour anymore, I don't. I don't think they'll completely, you know, just stop the Kiss machine altogether. I, I think they'll probably, you know, maybe put out a new recording here and there. Um, who knows? But uh, uh, I'm a longtime Kiss fan, so I would like to see them continue in, in some form. Do you, uh, do you really think Gene Simmons would let that die? Unless he physically dies? Well, I, I think if if they do go forward with uh, finding new members to continue the band, I'm sure Gene will probably have, uh, have a large stake in the earnings that that lineup makes. Yeah. So and here's, I'm, I'm, here's my thoughts. The will never stop. Kiss is theatrical, um, but not at a level of, say, Alice Cooper. Or like Alice Cooper, you go to see a show of his. It's a stage show. It's it's almost like a, a magic show or at least a sideshow with magic aspects and things. Um, Paul has done musical theater. Uh, I think he's done mm-hmm. Phantom or something. And yep. we know that there's been a big surge in taking music from bands and making musical theater stuff out of it, like doing Mamma Mia for ABBA. Uh, Billy Joel has one. There's a whole bunch of different people who've done that. What if Kiss did something that was like an equivalent of those things sort of put together? Did a Kiss live stage show kind of thing for Love Gun? Just in general, but like took their best of songs and stuff and did a, a play a musical that they don't have to be in but at any point in time they could suddenly show up and be the understudy quote unquote that day and play on and then you could have all these other people who have either played with or wanted to play with or just grew up with kiss be the band to go and do it and instead of doing it like at a a theater run do it like a tour um but the the only question of that is um how do you do that and not do the elder? Oh wait, we've heard the elder. That's how. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I actually don't think the elder is really completely a bad album. I think there's some good no, tunes on there. Um, but I don't know. Like, I, I think there's, I think there's fans for every era um, of that band, and then I think uh, the hardcore fans like just accept all of it. But. That, that's a great idea, though. I think uh, 
I think that um, that would be a very marketable and an unexplored uh, avenue that that they could, uh, you know, they could try it. But you know, that, I think that's the really cool thing about Kiss is the fact that you know they've played the Super Bowl, they've played the Olympics. Um, you know, they they've done so many things that no other band has done. You know, they they had a, a pro wrestler, they had uh, um, you know all the different merchandising and video games, um, pinball games, I mean, comic books with their yeah, blood in it. It's it's you know a lot of people consider you know other bands doing stuff like that selling out, but like you know I I've, I've always appreciated their. Uh, approach of, you know, stimulate all the senses, you know, not only put out, you know, great rock and roll, but like put on a, a huge bombastic show as well. And, uh, <laughs> you think about it, I mean, like, um, Gene and Paul have really done an amazing job keeping the band going for 45 years. And, um, I mean, they've, their popularity has been up and down, but overall it's been a very successful band the whole time. And, uh, um, you know, I don't think too many, too many bands that have been around that long can say the, the same, you know, same thing. So oh, that's a good point. I think, um, Metallica is becoming, and I can't even say the modern day kiss because they've only been, what are they almost, Ten, they're so they're ten years younger as a band than Kiss, so they'll be forty and mm-hmm. twenty two. Um, but I'm looking at like I'm looking at their their merch store right now. <clears throat> you can buy watches. They have pinball machines, glassware, coffee mugs, koozies, which I guess isn't that out of the question. Um, they record every show. They have whiskey. They have beer. Um, James Hetfield started doing honey because he's a beekeeper now, so you can. Oh, buy that's it. funny. Yeah, so it's, um, which. <laughs> Thank I, goodness somebody is. Yeah, fuck right. They're they're doing like a charity event where you could bid on two pounds, and it was at eight hundred and fifty dollars. So I was like, fuck that. I don't, two pounds of honey. Yeah, two pounds yeah. of, a lot of James Hetfield honey. honey. For and that's like, turn that into some sort of alcoholic beverage, and now you've got my business. <laughs> well, yeah, it makes the whiskey formulate some some meat out of that or something well exactly <laughs> but oh god damn gosh, that show would cost so much when you really boil it down but i mean they're you know they're a high dollar production stage show they had a, a synchronized drone part during a song um they have these cubes that go up and down their video cubes and shit so it's um i think I, and i and I, I, mean, I think more bands are doing stage productions like that like i don't go to those shows really um yeah. Normally, the shows that I go to, it's nine million degrees, and there's two hundred people jammed into a tiny room, and it sounds like shit. Right. So, right. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what other bands are doing, but um, just in the fact, like you know, you can get Metallica shoes, and they just have everything. They made that movie, and they have you know DVDs. They have live recordings of every show, and you know, personalized or uh, um, specific show shirts and posters and shit. And it's like, but I think that's any big band that that gets to a point where they know that they've made all the money that they're going to make from their albums they they kind of hit a, a stagnation on that and it becomes how much merchandise can we sell and what new merchandise can we introduce that people want right sure. it, like uh greg barrett uh, as comedian he did this bit where he was talking about i'm at an age now where i don't need another rock and roll t-shirt but you know uh, a rock and roll day planner would be fucking awesome, you know. Where's my my <laughs> Weezer tea cozy? Where where's there? And and it it's funny, but it's it's the truth is that I am at a point where I don't want to like get jacket anymore. I haven't been at that point for thirty years. But a tasteful striper for old man Corey kind of thing. I would rock that. I would rock that proudly because I was a big striper fan when I was a teenager. And I follow Michael Sweet on Instagram, and I'm like, man, I'm an I'm an old man rocker, too. Just not the the degree of like making that kind of music and stuff. But I I feel like you have to take that to that level. And Kiss hasn't sold out because Kiss was always 
that act, you know? And I, I think yeah. that they, they did something really magical by making the characters bigger than the people. And I think where they lost track with people was when they stopped being the characters and started being themselves and getting that back means that they can franchise that they can bring into that next level, but it adds the mystery back to it. If you do say we're going to have a next generation of kiss, it's not like finding a new member for TLC. It's like, you don't know who's going to be underneath the makeup, but you know, you're going to get what we have marked as the kiss experience from them. And that makes it, I think, kind of cool again. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think, I don't know, I, I we're assume not. we're all around the same age, but I think... Corey's 85. There's a big difference. What's that? Corey is 85 years old. Oh, right. <laughs> um, well, I, I think we're all products from the 80s, and I think we have a kind of like a set standard of what we expect out of rock and metal bands and we have an appreciation for you know those genres that is different than i think um the current uh the younger generation because like you know we were used to you know camping out or or waiting in line for concert tickets or buying magazines to read up on our favorite bands and you know buy albums and cassettes and vinyl and all that and that's and i think um like I, I, I think that. Oh, sorry. No, no, Go ahead. no, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. But like, I vividly remember going to a record store and like I had, you know, I pre-ordered. Um, now this is going to age me a little bit, but I pre-ordered Saint Anger. I think that was the first Metallica album that I got the day it came out. Maybe it was Reload. I think it was Reload. But it's like okay. I remember going in there and pre-ordering that album, and the day that it came out, I went and I got it and I listened to it. And now it's, you know, bands put out. You have a ten album. CD that's coming out three months from now. Well, you're going to get four songs that come up before that thing even comes out. And then at midnight, it's just there. It's on the internet. If you pre-ordered it, it's immediately downloaded to your phone or it's immediately on Spotify. And it's just, there's something special. Like I still buy vinyl for certain bands. There's something special about having that record sit there, you know, and, and, and going back to Metallica, I bought every Metallica album on vinyl, even though I have it in digital format, I have it on CD uh, but but I I wanted the vinyl and I it can set it on my wall while I'm listening to it and it's just I don't know there's something special about it just having the physical item. It, it, it's I think it's because it's a it's a type of ritual it's it's an event you get up off of where wherever you're sitting and you know pick up the vinyl or the CD take it out and you're looking at the artwork and you you put it in your your record player your CD player your tape deck. And you sit and listen and you purchased it. So you have a, you have a personal investment. And even if you didn't like the album, you're going to, you're going to give it, you know, a few listens to, to try to like it because you spent money on it. And I think that experience is lost with new generation and with technology. Um, because like, it, it's just a bunch of white noise that it's free and people aren't putting the time and effort and the passion into it like they used to. And like, and you know, that's why, I, you know, I love kiss so much is because they, they give you, you know, every aspect um, of the experience that you can possibly get yeah. and they make it memorable and make it an event. It's not just a, you know, a concert of, you know, some people that look like they just walked up from the audience, you know, they, they, work very hard to put on a presentation that you're you're going to remember for years. So and with with that being said, do you think that they could get away with make it with replacing the members of Kiss because you're making you're making it an event and it's more something you go to versus see this band. Like I'm going to go see these characters. Like if they go back to the character format instead of you know Gene Simmons as the demon or you just you're going to go see the demon. Like, do you think yeah. that that's something that they could theoretically do successfully and well enough to to ro- like keep Kiss alive? I I think they could for the simple fact that there really isn't any bands like Kiss around, and I mean there, there's you know nothing against like you know the modern bands out there, but like 
you know, all these bands that are, are retiring or dying off, um, you know, Black Sabbath and Motorhead and who knows how much longer Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, they're going to keep going. Right. Um, you know, all, all these bands that we grew up to, there's nobody really to take their place because I think because of technology, because, um, um, you know, people make the argument that, that, uh, you know, you can release everything yourself. You don't have to go through a record label, but I don't think you get the distribution and the advertising right. that you once could before, because now the internet, it, it, it's just, there's too much on there. I mean, there's... people aren't really gonna, go out of their way to like become a loyal fan like they used to in my opinion right and and i agree with what you're saying and i think it's true that you can still get your music out there without a record label but there's a huge caveat to it like yeah i can put my like our music is on spotify we don't have a record label all i did was check a box for that but still like you have to go out and prove that you can do it having a record label kind of pre-proves it Saying like, well, yeah. they were good enough that these people gave them money or, or whatever. They they entered a deal with them. Um, the problem is, is that there are so many record labels that just fuck bands that like having a record label seems like a it's like a bad word now. Well, like writing, yeah. it, it's the same thing. Is you're a writer, and so people for a long time it was who's your publisher, get a publisher, get an agent, all these things. And that went out the window with Amazon and the ability to write on your own. But for a long time, people didn't take the product as seriously if you didn't have a publisher uh, or they think it should be a dollar or as cheap as possible or free um, because, well, you know, you're getting all the money now. And it's like, well, no, Amazon's kind of considered the publisher. And if you price it under a certain price point, you lose uh, 70% of what you would make versus 30%. But it took a long time for the the writers to establish themselves. And then you have the, the old school writers who don't want to go that route, who, who trust having a publisher, who, who see the benefits of that. Neither one is wrong, but in this generation, we're in a generation where people just want to consume everything as much as possible. I don't think for the average person, they see a difference, but you can hear a difference. You can see a quality difference when you're talking about someone who, who's gone into a studio and worked with a producer uh, because a producer puts a different flavor into the mix when it comes to a good producer does versus somebody who's working on their own in, in Pro Tools at home. Yeah. If you work with a producer, if you work with a Bob Rock or something, or if you work with a songwriter, um, going back with Kiss stuff like Desmond Child, it makes a difference into the final product of what people hear. Yeah. And that oh, I think totally. is what sets it apart. Yeah. And, and I, I think there's a lot of variables that, that being one huge one that, uh, you know, I think people are, are content um, recording and releasing what they put together in their home studios and putting it up on YouTube or, you know, just recording themselves play and putting it up on YouTube. Um, the work ethic as far as getting out there isn't the same. I think Dave Grohl like said something along the lines of like, you know, American Idol and the voice and shows like that, that that's not, that's not how a, a band or a musician is made or should be made. It, it, it's starting out in a garage or a basement and sucking and having your friends tell you you suck and you keep playing and, and like you keep writing and recording until you get better and, and you get out there and play shows and you tour and, and, you know, blood, sweat and tears and just like, you know, get out of your house and, and play in front of people. And it seems like people are just so content um, doing the YouTube thing. Yeah, well, I mean, in the American Idol sense, you see somebody who's an actual musician show up on American Idol every once in a while. Uh, Casey Abrams, I think, was a guy who was on there that played so many different instruments, had had a real sound, would like to sing a cappella stuff, had, had an old soul when it came to music. And he was in the top 10. He got to go on with the show for a ways, but he also got out of it pretty fast because... That's not what that audience is looking for. Right. I think it might have been the sure. same season as Scotty McCreary winning. And Scotty McCreary was the little boy from the very beginning that's like Idol wanted to make him American Idol. Mm -hmm. 
And so sure. you can you can see the pushes. They know what their market really is, and you'll get little hints of that. But that's not what those shows are meant to produce, you know. And and if there's a making the band with with actual like a band, it's hard to get four people or five people into a room and make them work together. That's a struggle that takes years of finesse to say, <laughs> wow, this keyboardist is a dick. Let's get rid of him. Yeah, and, and I know Kyle can vouch for this. He's been in the same situation as I have, but there's just something special about people who are your closest friends and you're creating something with them. And, and you know, from the time that, and I play drums, so Kyle can probably see it from a different angle, but from the time that your guitar player comes in and is like, hey, I got this riff. And then it's like, hey, keep playing this. I got this idea. And then the bassist opens his mouth and ruins the entire song. But it's it's like, <laughs> sorry, I, Ken is one of my best friends. But um, there's just something super special about it. And, and then once you finally lock it down and, you know, your vocalist puts his, his touches on it and then you go and play it in front of a room of people or four people. But just to see that people enjoy it and, you know, that what I created, someone likes and then to have it on CD, and, and it's like now I'm to a point where I do it for me. Like, I don't care if anyone comes to our shows. I love that people come, but we're just doing it for us. Like, we're, we're writing music that we want to write because it's something that we want to do, and then we're recording it, so we have it. Um, it's just you can also buy it from me, and you can also listen to it online, or you can buy it online. Um, and I think a lot of times these people get so fixated on just the I'm going to be famous you know, I'm going to be in a band, I'm going to yeah. be famous, that they kind of forget about what it is. It's it's a creative process. It's like being an artist. Although I saw a lot of that in the 80s, too. I saw a lot of local bands oh, that, fuck, because they had yeah. the right look and they had the, the ability to get the right equipment and they had the right length of hair, you know, just assume that they were going to be the next break-in thing. And, and I think any industry has that. Someone looks at it and goes, stop. I can do what that fucker's doing. Yeah, that'll never stop. Right. Yeah, but YouTube is an equalizer in the fact that anybody could be famous. You don't have to be in the right place, right time, but there is a differentiator in what the audience finds and what they'll continue following. And some of that is is more personality than it is talent. Yeah, there was. Uh... Yeah, I, I agree because on social media or YouTube, um, anybody can be self proclaimed whatever, mm -hmm. and. I kind of related to Guitar Hero, like, um, worked at a pawn shop for years, and I would have kids that would come in asking for it when it was popular. Every time I would try to talk them into buying a real guitar. I was like, hey, you right. got to memorize buttons. You might as well memorize frets and strings. Yeah. And, you know, they they would turn it down almost every time. And it just, to me, like, that just, like, glorifies somebody who isn't a musician. and you know, they, uh, they basically like, you know, flood the, flood the, the internet with, um, you know, whatever their take on, on writing music is or whatever. And I, I think it, uh, it saturates the market for people that are actually trying really hard to, to get somewhere with music. Yeah. And I think, you know, what radio stations, kind of forced on everybody's ears and, and uh, um, you know, just the mainstream, I, I think really makes it hard for the underdog, i.e. rock and roll and heavy metal nowadays. Yeah, but do you remember, uh, it, it must have been 90, 91 or something when Danger Danger came out? And, I, and I'm, I'm calling out Danger Danger. I don't remember if this was them or if it was another band that was just like them. It was basically, it was a band put together by someone like Desmond Child where it was exactly the the perfect look, the perfect choreography, the we all shake our heads and asses at the same motion, we swing the guitars around in the same time, we do everything that it was so clinical about what hair metal was at that point in time that it was pretty much the stamp on like this is it, this is all that that exists of this now, and nirvana came out at about the same moment and it was immediately everybody said fuck this noise and went over to seattle grunge because yeah. somebody is going to always figure out a way to game the system or or see what the system is and say 
oh yeah, well, that's all it takes. Okay, well, let's do the best version of that. And the best version of that isn't the best version of that. The best version of that is the people who are doing it because they truly love it and because they dedicate themselves to it and because it's their all-encompassing being. But it's, it's really funny because the industry is like, well, yeah, but I can't market your love. I have to market a look and I have to market a sound and I have to market a, a style that people are familiar with so that I can play this and it leads directly into the next thing that sounds just like it and leads directly into the next thing that's just like it. And we get 10 of those and then we restart the loop again. Yeah. And then you, you can definitely see that in the trends of, of each decade. I mean, like with Nirvana came Soundgarden and, and uh, Pearl Jam and, you know, all the, all those grunge bands and, you know, same thing with, with hair metal, like everybody was trying to one up one another or, you know, try to sound like whatever band or even, you know, existing bands like, you know, when Judas Priest was uh, on tour with Pantera shortly after they came out with Painkiller because Pantera had an influence on their writing during that time. Yeah. Oh, I never so like, I mean, that, that definitely kind of goes hand in hand, I think with, uh, with any genre um, and any era that uh, people are going to jump on the bandwagon. I just was basically saying that like, you know, people that, you know, I, I went to a, a music college uh, to try to, you know, gain some more knowledge and, it was a, a music business uh, combined with uh, um, a music school. And there were people in my class that were not musicians and they were very computer illiterate. Like they, they really didn't even know how to operate a computer, but yet there was a keyboard in front of them that allowed them to record um, samples or, or sequences, um, just randomly pressing different keys <laughs> And the, the assignment was to, you know, record such and such a song. And so, like, they had no knowledge in the instrument, let alone writing, but somehow they were able to record it right. and receive credit and a grade on it. And I, I equivalate a lot of modern pop and R&B kind of the same way. Like, there's six or seven people that have a hand in... in writing whatever they're putting out, but they, they really don't have a, a whole lot of knowledge in what they're doing. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I almost think, went to uh, the Atlanta Institute of music. It was at the round at the time when everybody was going to musicians Institute for, for GIT or BIT or whatever. Um, uh -huh. And I was really convinced. I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to go do, but I would have had no clue. I would have stepped in there and just immediately been over my head being surrounded by people who are actual musicians who had dedicated themselves. So I wound up going to a local college for music and pretty quickly determined like what was in my head was not what doing that was. And, and there were incredibly talented people in my classes and they were all really wonderful and fun to work with. And I learned a lot from them, but in the end it's like, it's 30 years later and I'm not a musician, <laughs> but, but I was listening to some Ed Sheeran song the other day uh, with, with my wife in the car and the, the chorus is pretty poppy and stuff. And I start singing along to it, except I was singing no scrubs by uh, TLC <laughs> because it was the exact same <laughs> tune. And, and my wife was like, Holy shit. She's like, that's really cool that you could just pick that out and do that. I'm like, that's not musical talent though. That's math. Yeah. And, and a lot of music can come down to math if you don't, feel anything about it and if you don't have the the non-technical side but the emotional side to it and both of those things are valuable but that that's exactly what i'm saying though is that there's one that's been emphasized which is making beats and coming up with with a, a just a, a hook somewhere um as blues traveler would put it and the other is <laughs> someone who who pours your entire life into it sure yeah, I think music. Yeah, like, I, I agree. Uh, movies are all going to become uh, relatively recycled. Like you know, uh, <clears throat> I think in a less obvious fashion. So I mean, clearly in the past ten years there have been what three reboots of Spider-Man. So yeah, right. Uh, you saying that that 
what you said it was Ed Sheeran. I don't know. I kind of tuned out when you said Ed Sheeran because I lost some respect for you. <laughs> but uh, you said that I appreciate that was... the Blues Traveler uh, uh, slide in, though. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, Corey's good for something once in a while. But uh, to say that you know Ed Sheeran is basically just playing TLC, um, <clears throat> I think you're going to see a lot of that where, and and you kind of already do consider <laughs> Vanilla Ice and the Queen song. You know, I just yeah, sure. I just put a yeah. extra beat. It's a different song. So I think you're going to see more shit like that, and that that sucks because there are how many notes, how many sounds can you make with a guitar? How many sounds can you make with an instrument? Um, sure. When I was in Nashville, someone's like, "Hey, let's go to this this bar. There's this awesome band." I'm like, "Whatever, I'm down." I also wasn't paying for anything, and it was like this girl with a keyboard and a sheet over her head, and the four people I was with, they're like, "This is so fucking strange. This sucks. Let's go." And I'm like. I don't care for it, but I would stay and watch it because it's interesting. If nothing else, it's different. And you know what? This girl is making her own music. It's weird as fuck, and I don't understand it. But she's making it, and she's on the stage. So why leave? That's awesome. That, that, that's, I totally I people voted should have that, leave, that but, uh, yeah. perspective on it. and if, Especially if it's different, if it sticks out, if, if it's not following you know the mainstream format i think that that uh that demands a little, little bit more respect and um I mean, you know, we, i have i have a lot of people who won't come and see us play because they're like oh it sounds so cool and then your singer screams i'm like but i'm like what i'm like give me an hour of your life i'm not saying you have to love it just come and see what we do if you still yeah. don't like it, cool. But it's an hour of your life. What else are you gonna fucking do? Sit at home and watch TV? You know. Well, I think that I think people going out to shows I, I think is uh, not as common as it used to be either. I mean, venues are having a tough time staying open, and yeah. um, you know a lot of factors involved with that. You know, the smoking ban and DUI laws. You know. You know that of which is a good thing, but like right. it, people don't go out don't and, and uh, party and and uh, enjoy you know shows as much as they used to either. I don't think. No, th- I mean that's a good point. Um, another one I hear a lot of since I'm on my complaining soapbox is you play so late, and <laughs> yeah, right. to which I say is right. it's, it's late for me too. Like I get up and I go to work just like you do. I said, but you stand yeah. there and sip a beer, it's like, I have to be incredibly physical for 45 minutes. Yeah. Don't fucking complain. <laughs> and then load all your shit up in your, your yeah. van or truck, Yeah. drive home, and, and go from being wired to being able to go to bed to get up in the fucking morning. Yeah, and you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, that's cool, you play in Milwaukee all the time. And I'm like, yeah, it's great. And then I get home at 4 in the morning because... <laughs> We, we play at 11 or 12 or whatever, and then you pack up, and then you sit around because you, you have to sit around and socialize. You don't want to just leave. You don't want to be that guy. Well, now I'm finally leaving at 2 in the morning. Well, then I got to drive two hours to get home, and then I have to take a shower, and then I got to go to bed, and then I'm fucking awake at 8 a.m. It's like, but it's worth it. it. To me, it's worth it. I don't know. I don't know how. Kyle, you had a different situation no, I... because you lived in Minneapolis. I mean, you literally was like, what, fucking 20 minutes to wherever you, whatever venue you'd play at? Uh, with the exception of when you were on tour, but yeah, man. I mean, I don't know. Like, I think that does separate, you know, somebody who's passionate from somebody that just wants to be famous. Um, yeah. You know, like you have to, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. I mean, there's gonna be times that you play to ten or twenty <laughs> of people or hundreds or thousands and. You got to put on the same show regardless, and oh yeah. yeah, you know people. You know when when you just put it out there for what it is, like you know, you know playing a show in Milwaukee, living in Minneapolis. Okay, well, it's a five hour drive, and you got a half hour, forty five minutes set, and you got to get there early for load in, and you got to stay late for load out, and oh, you get <laughs> stiffed, and you don't get paid, or you get paid very little, and. Now you got to find some place to stay or drive back late. And most people are like, well, that, that sounds stupid. That's too much work. And what are you getting out of that? And you wind up in a green room. Time on, 
What's that? I said, or you wind up in a green room situation. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know. I, I think it's one of the greatest feelings in the world, you know, to be on stage. And I've always felt like it's worth it no matter, really no matter what the situation, because like, you know, the stories you accumulate on tour and the, the friendships you make, um, I think being in a band, regardless of the genre, is kind of the secret to eternal youth. Like it, it allows you to have the, that excitement and the creativeness and the ambition of when you were a teenager. And if you stay driven, you can continue it as, as long as you want. Um, and I mean, like I've been trying to hit up a lot of concerts of older musicians that I haven't seen and the oldest being Tony Bennett. The guy is 91 years old and he's still, he's still on stage. And I, I think that is amazing. And Willie Nelson is another one. He's 85 and he's still playing. And it, it's a talent and a gift that you're given. You know, it, I think it's a shame to, to see people not use it or, or not exercise that passion. All right, let's go ahead and get into the movie, The Shining, which I learned my wife had never seen, so I'm actively filing divorce paperwork. <laughs> well, you're going to lose two wives. What? You hadn't seen it? Or I have never, up until this point, watched it, I think, straight through before. I am so familiar with it. Not, not a day goes by that I don't think Aaron's rewatching The Shining or Poltergeist or any number of, like, five to 10 different horror movies, but I've never like been, Oh, I need to go and watch the shining. And so, yeah, it, it wasn't a new experience, but it was kind of new. It's not a quick watch. It's, it's a long kind of a slow moving movie. Yeah. I didn't realize it was two hours long. I mean, I had seen it before, but I never really thought about how long it was until this. Which, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where to start because there's so much to talk about. Um, it is easily probably the most, I don't know if recreated or referenced is, is the better term, but um, that movie or movie ever. I mean, think about the fact that The Simpsons did an entire section on it. Um, yeah. Just the countless references to it. The Ready Player One movie that came out last year. The dance scene. Um, there was a scene that was supposed to be about another thing, and they couldn't do it, so they wound up referencing The Shining instead. Yeah. And uh, and pretty pretty well. I, when Aaron and I watched that a few months ago, she started laughing because, like, one, how well they referenced it, but, but two, just to see it show up in this. And I had to kind of wonder, like, I know that the whole thing about Ready Player One is movie references and 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 all that kind of stuff but like so much of it was spent on the shining and i don't know how much of the audience for that movie today recognized of the shining from its time because when did the movie come out ready player one 1980 no sorry shining yeah 19 oh Kyle's right yeah so that's that's a good long bit of time in between um, to to have it be such a big part of a modern day film. Yeah, and, and I mean, I know it's pretty common knowledge that Kubrick uh, didn't stay true to the book. I've never read the book because I think it's common knowledge. I can't read. Um, but the movie is still so fucking good. Like in every facet, yeah. it's just a good, good movie. I, I always heard that Stephen King didn't care for it, and that's why he made the TV made for TV movie version of it, which I didn't really care for. <laughs> but I guess it just—I never read the book either. But I hear it, there were just some some parts of the movie that changed what the novel um, had written it. One of the things about the the King versus Kubrick stuff is that it, it's claimed, at least, that Kubrick was kind of slamming King with some of the things he did. So in the book, the uh, the bug that Nicholson drives is red, but in the movie it's yellow. And then at some point later on, um, 
when the caretaker is driving up, he sees a a truck wreck. And underneath the truck is this destroyed red Volkswagen. And that's supposed to supposedly be a fuck you to King of like, yeah, I just ran over your thing to make my thing. And that's, that's one of the things that we have to talk about this movie is that there is a, it's a sect, but it's, it's almost like a cult of people who are so worshipful of Kubrick and his films and the things that he does. And, and this movie in particular has so many goddamn points of view of like, oh, it's about the Nazis or, oh, it's about Native Americans. Oh, it's about this. It's about that. Um, it's Kubrick's uh, admission that he f- helped stage the moon landing. Um, that yeah. it the movie as itself can't really stand on its own without having to deal with all of these bullshit people that it, basically that are the same frame of mind as uh, 9-11 conspiracy theorists in how much they believe they understand the inner workings of this movie better than anybody else who fucking watched it or the people who worked in making it. Are you referring to, I uh, can't remember the name of the documentary, but it was on, it was on Netflix. Um, basically like pointing out like the, the product placement throughout the movie and the different conspiracies involved. Yeah, the Indian on the uh, packaging for the, uh, I think it's like baking powder or something. And because yeah, the Native yep. American artwork and stuff up there. Yeah, and I uh, I, I did watch that. Uh, room 237, I think is what it's called. It's named after the yeah. room in the movie. Although in the book it was 217. And there's theories yeah. about like, well, there is no room 217 uh, or there is no room 237 in the hotel. And like all this back and forth. In, in wikis, there's all these things of like, oh yeah, we called up the place and it's this, and then somebody else says it's complete opposite, and that's the problem is that everybody has made their theories up, um, but it that movie just kind of laid it out for everybody to watch. But those things have existed for years. It's like the people who talk about the uh, Hotel California album from the Eagles and how it has to do with the Satanic Church and Anton Lavey is on the cover, except he's not, and so it's it's just. It's that same kind of crap. And I'm like, man, just watch the fucking movie and get what you get out of it. But some people just are adamant believers. And that just doesn't sit right with me. You know, me neither. And it's funny you should bring up the Eagles because I I actually just watched uh, an Eagles documentary and Don Henley addresses, you know, Hotel California and you know, what it's supposed to be about and like all these, um, you know, people like, uh, having their own takes on what it actually means. And he said that, you know, it's some songs, um, are, are just better not to be revealed what, you know, it's actually about. It's, it's up for interpretation. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, that version of the shining, I think is kind of, very similar to hotel California. Like I don't really think there was any conspiracies or might've been some, <clears throat> some hidden gems that Kubrick put in there um, here and there. But I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's really a conspiracy type movie myself. And I don't, I don't know. I, like Corey said, I just, I just wish people would just watch the movie. Yeah. And that sucks, but I mean, think about the fact. Think of every reference of this movie, or everything that has referenced this movie. Like Slipknot has a music video. Um, Thirty Seconds to Mars did a music video in the hotel, also kind of in the vein of the movie. Uh, Murder by Death plays a show at the hotel every year on New Year's Eve. I believe you can pay Your extra. Family. Yeah, and I believe you can pay extra to to stay in room two seventeen or two thirty seven. Oh, that's pretty cool. I want to believe. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you can you can just go visit the Stanley. Like it's it's there. You can go do it too. And, and you know, people like I've wanted to go there. Um, I kind of got it from you. Like with you with uh, you went to the house, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house to eat breakfast. I wasn't able to get there when I was in Austin, but. When I was down there, the gas station is now a barbecue restaurant. 
That's awesome. So yeah, after you and I had talked and I went down there for work, I went, I flew in a little early and went there. And the, the bus from the original movie is like sitting out front. So it's like to be able to That's see really cool. and to be able to sit inside of a place that was in one of your favorite movies is just so fucking cool. So Yeah, it's a neat experience. Yeah, so going back to what I'm saying is like just enjoy the movie and enjoy what it's supposed to be and enjoy what else, you know, what else you can do as a result. Like, yeah, but isn't that yeah. kind of before we had the internet, everything was urban legend. Everything was you know, oh, there's razors and apples at Halloween, and there's there's these different things, and you didn't have something that could actually definitively say whether or not it was true. You know, you you'd hear Richard Gere and hamster stories and believe them because, well, who the fuck made this up, and why has it traveled around so far that everybody knows this if it's not true? And and that's what happens with these things. And plus, when you have churches that give conspiracy theories about record albums. You know, that's supposed to be your authoritative, like, they're telling me, sadly, uh, what to think in some cases, and uh, how much you question your peers versus the unknown. And and that's what an X-Files is, and that's what a Men in Black and and uh, and the stuff in Nevada is. But honestly, at this point in time, we should have some fucking idea as to if any of this is verifiable but we're in an era where people believe that the earth is flat <laughs> i just like i i don't i don't blame people for having conspiracy theories about stuff but i blame people for perpetuating it uh to the point where it just gets louder and louder so that you inevitably find more people that believe it because it's like well if all of these people are on it it's like well stop fucking validating it yeah. stop making it be a thing uh, because you know that's dumb. I, I don't need to explain to somebody that we actually have evidence that the moon landing happened. But you keep screaming loud enough that, well, no, it was all fake because of Kubrick. Fuck. More and more people are going to buy into that shit because they don't want to believe the truth because they don't trust the truth for so many other things. It's kind of things like that that kind of make movies or albums uh you know special like you know the spinning spin the record backwards you know and say paul is dead and you know right yeah. things like that like it, it it builds hype and builds an urban legend around you know that that uh that movie or, or album and i think it adds mystique to it which i, I think is actually kind of cool even if you know you don't believe it 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 adds a different edge to it like in that that documentary, the Room Two Thirty Seven, they show a scene of how they're talking about how they played the movie forwards and they played the movie backwards over top of it, and you see how things line up, and that looks really cool. And I'm a person who has downloaded the Pink Floyd Wizard of Oz movie uh, with those things sync point happened and watched it all the way through, and it's like, yeah, there are parts of this where it's like, shit, that really syncs up well, but you also kind of have to realize. There's no fucking way Pink Floyd sat there and said, oh, let's make an album and the entirety of it syncs up with Wizard of Oz. It, it's oh, just yeah. nobody put the, the time and effort to that because what did they get out of it? In the long run, it's like it's an album that sold on its own or didn't sell it on its own and it sold on its own fine. And it was years later that somebody came out of their fucking parents basement and said, dude, I was watching Wizard of Oz and I had Floyd on. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was just a strange coincidence, but again, it adds a different uh, different spin on it. So do you think that not just Kubrick, but this movie in particular gets more attention and more value given to it because of shit like that versus how good of a movie it is on its own? Because when it came out, it was not a beloved movie. Uh, critics didn't like it. People didn't think it was that great. It took it a while to catch on. And did it catch on because someone started leaking shit about what a genius Kubrick was? Because uh, he had had a failing in the movie right before this one, and, and that's why he wound up doing this, is he he was so pissed off about how poorly receptive uh, the audience was to his previous film. Or is this movie something that is just really good? Because I'm going to admit, I'm not a Kubrick fan. Uh, there is not a Kubrick movie that is in a list of, like, 
I love that movie. It, it would be the closest thing would be Dr. Strangelove. And that's more because of Peter Sellers. But the rest of his stuff, I think my favorite Kubrick movie is probably uh, AI, which was as much Spielberg as it was his. Sure. Oh, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not really a fan of Kubrick's work overall myself either. Um, however, I'm a huge Jack Nicholson fan, and that was the major selling point for me to get in the movie in the first place. Um, because <clears throat> I think, you know, I think first time I saw it was shortly after the 89 Batman came out and I was a huge Nicholson fan from that point on. So I wanted to, you know, try to discover anything that he was in. And, uh, so like that was the reason I watched it. It wasn't because I was a Kubrick fan. Cause and I think so majority of, of his the... work is very, very slow moving and, and boring and sometimes hard to watch cause it's, it's just not captivating enough, but, I think that style works well in The Shining because it builds the suspense of, you know, Jack Sully getting um, cabin fever and building to the main part of the plot. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things about the movie is that Nicholson was that King didn't want Nicholson because he had done one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. And felt like it was too much of a giveaway that people expect seeing him to be crazy by that point. And and my thing with Nicholson is not that I don't like Nicholson, but that he's always Nicholson in anything that he plays. You know, you put him in Joker makeup, he's still Jack Nicholson. You make him the devil, he's still Jack Nicholson. I completely buy Jack Nicholson <laughs> as the devil uh, or as a wolf man, but it's because of who he is as much as the part that he's playing. But there were people that were mentioned like Robin Williams, who at that point was still really early in his career and was pretty much just Mork. I don't think he'd done Popeye yet. Um, yeah. And there were a lot of other people that, that were supposed to be tonally down, and then you get to see them have a breakdown. And Nicholson is just sort of manic as soon as you see him on the screen. I don't hate the depiction um, because it, it does make it very easy to buy into how crazy he goes. But I also understand that if you're looking for someone to see them break down as opposed to being on the edge of breakdown and then it just happening, you might want something different. Um, but what do you like his uh, depiction in this though? Say it again. You, you like how he depicted the character in this? I did because, you know, I, I would agree with you. Jack pretty much plays himself and, almost all of his movies, but it's such a potent character that he's one of the few actors that I think can get by with that. But like, <clears throat> you know, him going, going nuts and, and just that psychotic side of him. Um, I, I think he, he played it very well. I mean, even to the point where, uh, from what I hear, Shelley Duvall had to undergo, uh, extensive therapy afterwards because of it messed her up. It like his character frightened her in real life. Yeah. I also hear part of that was because of how Kubrick had the demands that he put on them as actors and how long the days were and stuff. And he constantly was changing the script on both of them. Uh, I guess Nicholson had complaints about that too. It was like, he didn't even bother learning the script at points because he knew they were just going to give him changes a few minutes later. So he was reading it right before doing the scene. Um, but yeah, and oh, Shelley Duvall oh. gets a lot of shit for her depiction in this movie uh, of how her character is. And and she's pretty over the top. She's so high strung emotionally. But again, I see that that could be what you want from the, the setup of these characters because she always sounds like she's on edge. She sounds like since the point where Jack hurt Danny and then had to give up drinking because of it, that she is an abused spouse that just it she never quite tell quite tells everybody the real story she gets almost there but she's still kind of making excuses in her head and so when she reaches her yeah. breaking point of like you've hurt our son again uh i'm done with you and then it starts to become more supernatural uh where she starts experiencing things as well 
that she breaks because she doesn't know how to take back the fact that she blamed her husband if this is him or if it's something else. But she's still, she's in a situation where she's got to be in fear for her life. I didn't hate her character, but I do understand that her character is very different in the book. Um, she's got more agency there. She's uh, she's a more strong-willed character there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think both her and, and Jack's roles were, were very believable. You know, they, um, you could tell, you could read the backstory of, of their characters together, um, based on, you know, how they both were, were telling about, you know, uh, what happened, you know, when he was drinking and, and, and that he wouldn't do it again. And, and, uh, you know, that, that subject being touchy and, and, I think that all all helped form the um, uh, what's a what's a word just uh, just how they depicted their characters. I, I think that made it all believable. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I, <clears throat> one thing that kind of drove me nuts is how limp wristedly uh, Shelley Duvall would hold a knife while running. Oh, right. Which, it seems so, like, <laughs> minute, but I'm like, I don't know. If I was really fearing for my life, I feel like I would hold on to that fucker like it was the end of the world. But picture your mom. That And, and this depends on who your mom is. My mom is, is tough as shit. Yeah. Uh, my mom's a hunter. My mom has taught other people uh, bow hunting, black powder shooting. Uh, she is a strong person. But there are definitely people in, in my life that I know that are, are much weaker and would react in that way. It, it's it's always the you, you scream at the the screen like, "Don't run upstairs! Don't do this!" You know why are you so weak? Why don't you fight back? But for a good amount of people, it's it's impossible for them to fight back. That's not in their nature of who they are, and they just become yeah. so overwhelmed with fear uh, and, and inherent weakness that they can't react in the way that we'd like to think we would in a situation like that. I think that makes it for a good horror movie too. Like they, they purposely, you know, put the victims in a situation or do things that we wouldn't do ourselves. So we, we are on the edge of our seats saying, no, don't do that. Or, you know, watch out. You know, that's part of the, I think key elements of, of a good horror movie plot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I do. Agree. <laughs> um, um I don't know if you guys know this or not, but uh, um, when I was in Cleveland, I went through the, the Christmas Story house and uh, got to learn a little uh, history about the making of the movie. And Bob Clark actually originally wanted to cast Jack Nicholson as the father. But hmm. since The Shining had come on not too long before, they, uh, they thought it would uh, his take on that character would be too scary and too closely associated with The Shining, so that that's why they decided not to cast him. I would really love to see a mix of The Shining and A Christmas Story. And now, I know I've seen the the horror movie trailer cut of A Christmas Story before, um, but that sounds spectacular. <laughs> yeah, that, that would definitely have been a completely different movie. Yeah, I would be curious. I never really cared for A Christmas Story, but. Uh, I would totally watch it with Jack Nicholson as the dad. And and Scatman <laughs> Brothers got his tongue stuck to a pole out in the the maze. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, now, did you guys see, happen to see the the made for TV um, version, like the Stephen King version of The Shining? I have not. I thought about looking for it. Uh, my wife has seen it, and she said it's really bad. Um, which I can I can understand, you know, made for TV stuff is always kind of uh, crapshoot, anyways. But I'm interested in it because it's got Stephen Weber, who I always like in things. Um, but on top of that, I would have liked to have seen the differences from it. But at the same time, like Matt, I haven't read the book, and I feel like I would probably get more of an idea of King's vision, his original vision, not his edited years later vision of what The Shining should be by reading that. And I, I just haven't done it yet. I would recommend at least checking it out. I personally didn't care for it. Um, but I 
also was partial to the original actor's version of the characters. Um, like the kid that uh, played Danny in the Made for TV version was like the, um, was it Haley Joel Osment or kid from Six Sense? And I, yep. I think yeah. that was no, maybe it was somebody else. But either way, like I. I thought the, I thought his version of the character was just really annoying and wasn't believable. I gotta, I'm like, and okay. and Jack Torrance in that version wasn't as scary or aggressive as Jack's. Yeah, and it, and that's that's also the other thing when the remake of it came out. Uh, Year before last, or was it last year? Um, last year, twenty seven. It it inevitably gets comparisons to the TV version, uh, which I've I've watched and is fine. But again, as a TV movie in the nineties for what it is, but it's also held to such a high esteem. One because there's a lot of beloved actors in it, but also because Pennywise was played by Tim Curry, and who doesn't fucking love Tim Curry? So it it's hard to be a remake of something that's existed that's been in the the minds of the fans for so long. I think the new it was an incredible movie. I think in in many ways superior, but that's not to steal away from what the original one was, and and it's not to say that you can't have a favorite. But it, it I think it's even harder when you've got a movie that we've already discussed is so iconic even if it's not true to what the author's original intents were for the, the characters in the, the film, um, people are going to automatically always think of The Shining as Jack Nicholson busting through that door, the the old lady in the bathtub scene, all that stuff. And they're doing a sequel based off of a, a, a more recent King book, uh, Dr. Sleep, that is a sequel to the book, and in that case, more a sequel to the TV movie where uh, Scatman's character is still alive in it and stuff. And it's going to, I believe, suffer because it's not going to be an exact sequel to what is in more people's minds. And that is the Kubrick film than it is to the original source material that not as many people have read and not many people have, have seen um, the TV version of. Sure. That's interesting, though. I mean, I think for anyone that's a fan of The Shining in general, I think would probably be interested in seeing it. But like you said, I think generally, like people that aren't familiar with the novel, probably wouldn't be as apt to go and go and watch it or understand it. Yeah, and just the fact that it it's going to be compared to the location. So we had uh, our friend Jude was on here. Uh, last year, and we talked about his movie, uh, The Incantation. Mm -hmm. And Jude went and did this movie, and and it's got Dean fucking Kane in it, which is cool. But he did this movie at this place, and the place that he filmed it at is probably the biggest character of the film. You, You get a location like that, and you can't help but let it drive what your movie is. Um, and I feel like the Overlook Hotel in in Kubrick's film is the biggest character in that movie. As big as Jack is, as much as the stuff with Danny and, and the, the ghosts and stuff is, that hotel really is such a huge portion of what makes that movie work. And the mystery and the, the horror, it just has a feeling to it that draws you in and keeps you fixated that I think that's why people become obsessed with it is because it's just, it's so much and you, you can't help but Like if you saw that up, if you walked into that place after that, you would just be like, you would pour over every inch of it. And a, a sequel is going to have to contend with that as much as it's going to have to contend with the fact of like, well, this character didn't die. And uh, this, obviously we can't reference Nicholson here and these kinds of things. That place is huge. Yeah, it's a very interesting point that you bring up because I I strongly agree with that. I think like uh, location or um, a, a vehicle 
can be just as big of a character, if not a bigger character, than an actor. Like, you know, the DeLorean is just as big of a character in Back to the Future as, as Doc Brown or Marty McFly. And, yeah. um, you know, the Ghostbusters Firehouse is a huge character. <clears throat> you know, the Batmobile, you know, all kinds of things like that. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that point. Yeah, it's not like they're going to do a remake of The Shining someday and it's going to take place in Waikiki on a beach. <laughs> it's like yeah, a, right. a series of huts. Um, it, it, it's such a statement in and of itself. And, it, and it's key to the plot of the movie, you know, being trapped where yeah. they were and stuff. But it they is. build it up from the very beginning. The, the helicopter shot going over it, the, the whole talk of like, uh, didn't the Donner Harvey happen around here? All that stuff is... A, a part of what sets the entire tone for that film and it traps them and it's what they have to escape from in the end. Um, yeah. That, that, that's another thing of like, I don't know if that was luck or if, how much planning went into that location choice. I mean, he obviously he got permission to film there and it wasn't the original inspiration for in the book. Um, they added no. the, the maze for the film but all that stuff really to me is is key to what that movie why it sticks in people's heads is that when i think of the shining i think of certain visuals more than anything as much as the here's johnny line is is like what people think of like the tagline for it which was an ad lib based off of johnny carson it doesn't make a lot of sense in the context of the film um yeah the the pictures of of that hotel and the the blood coming out of the uh, elevators and and Danny riding around in his big wheel, like that stuff is what is in my mind. Me too. Yeah, yeah me too. I, th- I think they uh, and, and to be able to go and and visit, you know, a film location like that, I think, you know, it's cool because like, even though it's not a a true story, it didn't actually happen. Like the the making of that fake story, which was the movie you know, did happen. That was a piece of history that happened at that specific place. And, um, you know, the exteriors were the Timberland Lodge and uh, Mount Hood, Oregon. Um, whereas, you know, the interiors were a set in England, but, you know, still to be able to either go to the Stanley where King came up with the, the idea and had the experience of the haunting or, to be in front of the Timberline Lodge, I think both are equally as cool to be able to witness. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, with that being said, any Well, cool? just real fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's the point where it goes from being the breakdown in the mind yeah. of of Jack, where we, we feel like, okay, he's talking to ghosts, he's seeing people around the hotel that obviously can't be there, uh, he's he's doing all these things, and and we're seeing him kind of have a mental breakdown. It goes from all of that being kind of explained as a, a, a personality, a brain that's fractured as it is, to wait now. Other people are seeing this. Other people are reacting to this. It, it's not just Danny with his psychic abilities and and the shine. The, the mother is seeing these things, like when she's going through the halls and she starts seeing people. When she sees. The weirdest fucking thing, the guy dressed up as the the bear or the dog yeah. uh, going down on the guy in the room. Like, what the fuck was that about? Um, yeah, that was strange. It, and it was just strange. It was just, did The Shining just introduce me to furries? <laughs> fuck. Um, <laughs> but, but she starts seeing these things actually happening. It goes from being a film about a guy with alcoholism and, and mental issues to a film about the actual supernatural. And that's a, that's a big leap in that sense of like nothing up until that other than, than Danny's abilities really is anything about that. But like all of a sudden they're all seeing it. So the place is haunted in some way. The place is corrupting them and attacking them in some way. And we don't get a real sense as to the why. And we get a little bit of weirdness at the end where we get the photo of Jack back in the 1920s 
standing in that room in a photo up on the wall. And it's like, did the place absorb him? What did it do? So what do you think that the, the ending of that really comes down to? Because I think that that's the interpretation for us as, as viewers is an important part of rating it. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, um, I guess I've always kind of taken it, you know, at face value and never really analyzed it that deeply. Um, but I guess to answer that question now, I would say like, <clears throat> like a lot of horror movies, like, you know, the villain or the entity or whatever it is gains momentum and gains clear access to this plane when people believe or fear it. And I would say maybe that would, that would have been the reason that everyone else started to see things is because everything was becoming more real. And that's an interesting, like uh theory of him getting absorbed. Um, I guess that would probably be a good, I would agree with that theory um, that he was, you know, just absorbed into the history of he's always been the caretaker. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do you have a, a thought on it? Nope. <laughs> I just watched the movie, man. Hey, that's I, cool. I just, yeah, I, yeah, I'm just here so I don't get fined. Since Scatman Crothers character, I keep forgetting his name. I just, he's always Scatman Crothers to me. Uh, since his character, Mr. Halloran. He's been there as the cook for a couple of years. He's got he's got experience and time in the hotel. And he while he's afraid of room 237, he, he kind of leads Santa to be don't go up there. Uh, he feels like the hotel is normal and in check enough that he can exist there while being enlightened. And so to see it take off and happen so badly for for Danny and his family when he's gone and to the point where he realizes it and comes back, something has to happen to set it off. And is it that it, like you said, it, it feeds off of the inherent evil that it grows in Jack and then they, it becomes stronger because of it. Uh, is it, we see what we need to, to manipulate, like what we saw in the dad before when he killed his two girls. Um, is there a certain kind of person that I can grow with, um, to get to do what I want, or is it also that Danny's powers kind of activate it himself because he's a conduit? Does him being there kind of strengthen connection to Jack and to his mom, um, so that they become a part of it too? That that's the stuff that doesn't get explained in this that I would have liked to have seen feed out a little more. But that's what I would expect to be in the book. And as I understand it from what I've read, that's not what the book so much is about. Is it exploring the possibility that uh, because of his uh, his sixth sense that he's able to kind of create this alternate um, alternate timeline of they were the ones uh, that were originally involved in what happened rather than than Grady and his family? Maybe that's that's the thing that I don't know. I. It, without explanation of the daughters uh, or, or why the dad went, went off. It's just the, you've always been here is, is the hotel turning him into Grady because it needs him to be, to accomplish what it wants to accomplish. And can it not do that when there's so many normal people around when there's too much activity, it can't get anybody's attention enough. But when you're there and you get that, that sort of a uh, Ren and Stimpy space madness, uh, cabin fever esque. um, like my head can't get outside of the, itself. Um, I feel like all of this would be solved if we had the internet in that hotel. That's what I'm saying <laughs> is that if I could just sit here and, and watch YouTube videos and, and people playing games on Twitch and fuck around instead of having to watch some black and white TV with barely a signal, then maybe I would be okay. Well, maybe that's part of the brilliance of, of Kubrick is the fact that he did leave it open-ended and he didn't explain it. Maybe that's what, makes it uh 
more of a unique ending. Um, cause I, I don't know, like, I think, I think things in general, I think are analyzed a lot deeper nowadays. Like people want to, people want to find the meaning or they want to find the angle of whether or not to be offended. And, yeah. uh, I think movies back then and prior to the shining, I think we're just accepted more at, you know, face value and didn't really look into it that deep. But that's that just my opinion on that. I, I, you know, like it, um, like for example, like people are now analyzing characters of Sesame street and their sexual preference. Like, yeah, that's how it never crossed anyone's mind before. <laughs> why, why are people being that analytical with things? The, the Sesame street thing, I think is at, as much as there is the, some people want to label stuff. I do feel that there are, there are people out there that, want to be able to see characters on TV that they can identify with. And so they want them to be their, their LGBT heroes um, and to feel like that they're okay. And and I have no problem with giving kids that. Um, but I also, if, if the creators of the characters aren't like, well, that's what these characters are, then they're, they're not. I mean, you can't tell them that they're wrong but I also don't think Sesame Street is is an institution that wouldn't give kids that as well um, at some point to say, uh, yeah, we'll we'll have gay monsters on the show. We'll have they have an HIV uh, positive Muppet on the show. I, I, I think that Sesame Street is one of those things that tries to be so inclusive that it's not really like they're saying, oh, we don't want Bert and Ernie to be gay because we disagree with it. It's just. No, it's okay to be two guys who just live together, who are just best friends and love each other. Like Matt and I tell each other we love each other all the time. And it's we not... We don't live together yet. What? We don't live together yet. Yet, but I mean, <laughs> in a situation where that could happen... Yeah, I'd, absolutely. I don't... Well, I don't think that you have to exclude one to have the other. No, I, I don't think so either. I just... I think in people searching for comfort to label something, um, I think kind of kind of pigeonholes uh, or you know kind of paints whatever that is into a corner, like um, you know, like defining what style a metal band is nowadays. Like there's so many subgenres now, and yeah. you know, in Motorhead you know, was around, they just said they were a rock and roll band, but they were classified by their fans, you know, eight different subgenres. And, and it's like, I, I think to be, to be not so analytical and be a little bit more vague, like, you know, they're a hard edge rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. I think that leaves, I think it leaves it open more for people to, identify things together and be a fan of something together. But when it's analyzed to the point where you're dividing how you're going to define it or categorize it so many times, that's when you start to get into arguments and disagreements and people start getting offended because you're excluding <laughs> an element, <clears throat> excuse me, an element of the broader categorization of it. Right. That makes sense. I mean, and I'm I'm also I'm acutely aware that I am a a white heterosexual cis male. Um, I have had no shortage of things that were made in my image that I grew up with. So when I have Superman is a white heterosexual cis male uh, superhero, and then someone else comes along and it's like, well. What if what if Superman was played by uh, an African American actor in a movie or a Hispanic actor in a movie? I I can understand. Well, that's not who Superman is. That argument of like, well, he's always been this. On the other hand, shit, it's not like I've got a shortage of other white heterosexual cisgendered males to look at in superheroes that I could still identify with. So, all right, 
man, have your black Superman. It, it's not going to disrupt anything for me. But we become so possessive over the things that matter to us that that uh, that don't shit on my childhood kind of crap that we we feel like, oh, well, don't take that away from me. Get your own thing. It's like, well, sorry, but there's been hundreds of years of you not letting me have my own thing. And uh, it's still kind of taking some time to to ha- even the playing field. So I kind of feel like, yeah, let me have this one. You know what? I don't have a problem with it. Fucking have it. Yeah, I I see your point with that. I mean, like, that's happened with every actor that's played Batman or the Joker. You know, everyone has had their different takes and everyone has their different preferences of who they like the best. But <clears throat> ultimately... You know, each movie that comes out defines uh, a new generation. And I think, you know, you know, like like me and my sons, like, you know, compare Heath Ledger and Jack Nicholson all the time. And I think they're they're both great um, depictions Notice you of didn't say the Leto. Joker. But I think they're both awesome because they're different. So yeah, I think and, and having back a, the thing, like, a new, I had entirely no different take on it, like you were saying with It, I, I think yeah, it's very similar. Like, both Pennywise's are completely different, and I think that, that when things are remade, it's important to have a, a new spin on it. Unlike, uh, <laughs> unlike Nightmare on Elm Street, I thought the new version of Freddy was terrible and nowhere near as in your face as Robert England. But I think he was trying to be somewhat similar to the original character, but just without the edge. I, I think without the, the humor, I think it was all edge and no, no charm and personality that the original Freddie had, which Freddie shouldn't be charming and personable because he's a guy who is a molester who kills people in their dreams. But that is sort of what made the character fun and enduring is is it's in the era of horror movies where we rooted for the villain and in yeah. the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, which Jackie Earl Haley, I I have a huge amount of respect for just in, in a ton of stuff that he's done throughout his entire life. Um, but I agree with you. It was not for me what I wanted out of for Freddy Krueger. And, and what I was uh, saying, Superman, I did not like the Man of Steel movie because in my mind, there, there's no reason for Superman to kill and, and to write a story where Superman has to kill the villain defeats the entire purpose of Superman to me. But again, sure. every new version, it, 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 there's the opportunity to reinterpret or to make it something for a different audience. It's just, I, if you're going to get to the purity of what I see of Superman, it's not his race. It's not his sexuality. It's his values. And and I think if you change him by changing his values, you're missing the point of doing a Superman story. But the rest of it is just in in a lot of ways window dressing. I I yeah. I, I get that it's not up to me. You know, I I have the ability to make my own art. Um, I have the ability to tell my own stories and stuff. And so when I do that, then I can I can be the one who complains, and I can be Stephen King and say, you know, fuck Kubrick. Uh, <laughs> making this thing with Stephen Weber for ABC. Um, sure. But even in the end, King has to, and I think does, admit that Kubrick's Shining brought a lot of eyes to his work that wouldn't have existed otherwise and appreciates the fact that even if it wasn't a perfect interpretation of his book, it was something that was great art on its own. Yeah, I think it's a very important movie uh, in general. Like just for just for the history of film, I think it's. Uh, I know it's definitely been rated very high and and like you know, scariest movie of all time or or top 100 important movies in in history and you know because I don't think a movie like that could ever really be put out uh, like that nowadays. Like. You know, I, I think uh, just the tempo of the movie, I think itself makes it different than anything else that's been released. Yeah, I mean, I'm I don't know if you've seen it. I 
saw it. My wife and I were actually just talking about it earlier. Movie that came out uh, this year. Neither of us liked at all, but a lot of people really did. Uh, Hereditary, and I think that the pacing that of that out. is slow, and um, it, it expects a lot from the audience to stay dedicated to it and to to follow the story at points where it's not really trying to tell you stuff. Uh, but that is the closest I can think of something to the the pace of what this movie is. Um, I just really hated it. <laughs> I I was caught off guard because I knew nothing about it. Um, my uh, um, basically, it was just kind of a movie that I was tagging along with. Uh, like uh, another person made the choice of of which movie, and I didn't know it was you know, that type of movie and it caught me off guard. So like, I, it actually like, I thought it was a disturbing movie and, um, I think, yeah, it definitely had a slower pace. Um, but it, it, it surprised me as far as horror movies nowadays, because most, most new horror movies, I don't think have an element of, uh, <clears throat> have the old school element of actually scaring people. Um, but I, I actually would put that up there with The Exorcist or The Omen as far as, you know, just all out scary movie. Well, then we should definitely have you back sometime to to do a full review of it, because that's just it. Is My opinion is my opinion, and I don't try to, to label it as being better or, or smarter than anybody else's. Um, I can give examples. Like last week we did the new Halloween, and Matt, throughout most of my my talk about it thought I must have hated the movie because I tore it apart. Um, but in the end I liked it a lot. And, and that's just it is I will talk shit about a movie that I like um, as much as a movie that I don't like, because in the end I'm, I'm looking to, to give an honest review of my take of it, but it's just my take. And I'd much rather talk about yeah. a movie like hereditary with someone who loved it. Um, versus a person who's just going to agree with me, like, yeah, that movie was shit. I agree with you. Well, here's the thing. I I never said that I loved it. I actually yeah. didn't care for it. Oh, okay. But what I was impressed with was the fact that it scared me and disturbed me uh, to the point that it did because <clears throat> I haven't felt like that, you know, watched the movie since first time watching The Exorcist or The Omen. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that I wasn't going into the movie expecting it to be scary. <clears throat> so, like, right. I wouldn't watch it again. I just was, I was impressed, you know, from the standpoint of the feeling it gave me while I watched it. Because I wasn't anticipating that. All right. Well, then option B is we have you back on here and we talk about Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> Shocker, the the old old school eighties or early nineties movie. Yes. Nice. Wes Craven, <laughs> Kiss on the soundtrack. I mean, a lot of hair metal bands on the soundtrack. Yeah, that was a good soundtrack. Yeah, it was. With that being said, <laughs> Kyle, I know you got to get going, so let's go ahead. Uh, let's rate this on zero to five scale. You can give a justification or not. I think we just did that for the last 45 minutes. Um, Kyle, as our guest, you have to start. Five being the uh, best. the yeah. best? Yeah. I Honestly, I'd give it a five. Um, I, I don't think there's another movie like it, and I don't think there's going to be another movie like it, and the fact that my favorite actor is in it. Um, I... Right, that is actually my favorite horror movie of all time. Corey, how about you? Um, obviously, I am not at, at the, the level of enjoyment where Kyle is. Uh, I'm going to go for me, and this is strictly for me, uh, it's, a, it's a two. Huh, interesting. Didn't right expect on. you to rate it that low. Um, I gave it a five also. I mean, it's just such an iconic film, and... Uh, I remember seeing it young, so the nostalgia that's involved is uh, definitely helps it. But uh, yeah, 
Corey, since you're back, you have to read the outro. Oh, God, I don't even have it up. Oh. Hey, uh, so just, let's see I'll, if I can do this just, from memory. Do you just want me to do it? You, you can start. Uh, you can call and leave us a voicemail at 805-328-3966. Is that right? Yep. yep. Wow. Good. I've done that enough times. And uh, you can email us at pot at gncast.com. You can find us on Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, all those places. We're Podcasts of Terror. Or you can follow the Galactic Network as a whole. Uh, by you can do the mega feed and get all the different shows that are on the network. You can rate us at bit.ly slash pot review. Mm-hmm. We'd appreciate that. Or on the podcatcher of your choice. And uh, you can follow the show's Facebook group uh, under the Galactic Network on Facebook. Yep. Uh, if you want to give us money without actually giving us money, go to amazon.podcasthere.com. Shop like you normally would. We get a cut of what you spend. It helps keep this show free. Not like we're smart enough to ever charge people for it. Kyle, thank you very much for uh, coming and hanging out and talking about The Shining. I was surprised that it took us 141 episodes to actually talk about this movie. But I'm glad you're <laughs> well, thanks for having me, guys. Had a lot of fun. Absolutely. Do you... Um, it's up to you entirely if you want people to be able to find you and where, where you would like them to do that. Um, I'm not really active on social media <laughs> these days, but you know, you can look me well, up. You can point them towards a band's page that you like or something, you know, anything that you're kind of into right now. Um, no, uh, these days I'm, I'm just kind of focused on, being a dad on uh on home life and yeah. not really uh been kind of a, a hermit <laughs> as of lately but i'm sure i'll get back out There's sometime in the near future nothing so wrong. in other words kyle wants to point you to justin bieber's youtube t- channel jesus he didn't say that <laughs> right <laughs> Corey, uh where can people find you on the internets uh or your wife? i'm not doing a lot of uh internet stuff right now i mean if you look for Corey scott on things uh, i think i missed Spoke last week. My Instagram is C Christian Scott, mm-hmm. uh, which is just it's just pictures of my cat. Mm-hmm. My wife actually offered today to take over the podcast of terror Instagram since she can do Matt it. and I do so much with it. Yeah, she can do it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she's like, you should ask Matt. I'm like, you should ask Matt. He yeah. likes you more than he likes me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said, go to the Galactic Network uh, or Galactic Netcast Facebook page. Uh, where we do have someone, Anessa, who has been leading the charge for the entire network on there and and posting great and interesting stuff all the time. And there's a wonderful amount of people that are involved uh, just in conversations and stuff on the page. And you can see the shows that uh, Dave and Brad and everyone else out in the network are doing and be a part of that. Sweet. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and untapped at Matt the Lifeguard. That's going to do it for our episode of the Podcast Terror. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about Lost Boys with Deborah Voorhees. If you're not familiar with who that is, watch Friday the 13th 5, and she's the one who's topless. <laughs> the one. Uh, one uh, of the, ones, the most notable one who's topless in Friday the 13th 5. And she's also the inspiration for that uh, Wolfie is Fine yes. song, uh, which... It's a great fucking song. Understandably so. Great song, great video. But she's really awesome. She's got a new project uh, coming out with a bunch of people who are from the Friday the 13th films. Yep. Uh, F13, uh, which you can support on social media uh, through... Um, it's not a Kickstarter. Is it an Indiegogo? Indiegogo, I think. It's called Fanboy 13. Fanboy 13. Yep. Uh, so look for that ahead of time uh, so you can be ready to hear conversations about it. But she's pretty awesome. Yep. Well, we'll definitely get into that with her next week. Kyle, thank you again. We'll let you get on with your night. Thank you, guys. Yep, we will talk to you guys next week. Stay scared, everybody. Sounds good. Bye.